Last time we were talking about the different ways we use the word moments. We talk about moments of a force at a point, we talk about applied moments, we talk about reaction moments. All of these are the three things that you're going to need to have added up together when you get to doing equilibrium. Right now what we want to talk about is the moment of a force at a point. So if I'm looking about the moment of a force F at a point A, remember that a moment is a vector. It always has to have magnitude and direction. But the easiest way to do this is what we call a scalar method, where you're just going to take the magnitude of F times the perpendicular distance. The direction will come from your right-hand rule. So this D has to be the perpendicular distance from A, this point you want to take it about, to the point of application of force F. So the easiest one we always start with is something where you're already given a perpendicular distance. If you have this 3 feet and you have that 4 pounds, then the moment is 4 times 3. The direction is given by which way this will spin. So if you think about this brad that we were talking about before being right here, these would be going counterclockwise. Oftentimes, though, you're not given something that's quite that straightforward. When you're looking at a system like this, we need to use the principle of transmissibility. The principle of transmissibility says that you can slide a force along its line of action to anywhere else on the body you're considering as long as you slide it along its line of action and you don't move it off the body. So if I slide this force down to where it actually hits that D, I can still do moment is F times D, and it will still be counterclockwise. Oftentimes, though, what we have is actually forces in Cartesian form. If you have a situation like this, we want to use the fact that moment is a vector and add them up. So we can find the moment at A due to Fy, which is going to be Fy times its perpendicular distance dx. And the moment at A due to Fx, which is Fx times its perpendicular distance dy. Both of these tend to be spinning this in the same direction. So sometimes I will tell students to put your pen right here and pretend it's that brad. Which way does this force make that point spin? That's the question. We're looking at which way this force makes that point spin. And that gives you these little curly Q arrows. You'll see some of these sometimes put underneath the, the direction because the signs of M are determined by whether or not these are the same or different. So the tendency to turn point A, clockwise or counterclockwise, is what determines the direction of moment, not the signs of the forces, whether this is in the positive or negative or X direction. It's these little arrows that tell you which way M is going. Now we do have a situation where we have two perpendicular lines, and we're coming up with a third. So we can actually do these with cross products. If you have the calculated the moment of at point A due to F, and let's just say that F acts at point B, then M sub A, this moment at point A, is actually equal to R cross F, where R is the position vector from A to B. We do that in 3D a lot because we're actually going to be find it easier to write um, cross products than to do a whole bunch of breaking things into a whole bunch of components and trying to add them up. We will do that too, but when we're looking at a cross product, all we have to know is what R and F are. R does not have to be perpendicular to F, that's what the cross product is for. The right hand rule still applies if you want to think about it. Put your hand out R, curl in the direction of F, and your thumb is telling you which way this goes. Sometimes people do it with three fingers too. Your first finger is R, out the direction of R. Your middle finger is F, and your thumb is going to give you the direction of your moment. couple points to remember as you're going along in here. M is equal to FD only if D is perpendicular to F. You can add the moments like vectors, but you can't necessarily add all the forces and then take a single cross product. That usually doesn't work. It only works if all of these forces act at the same point. If M1 is going counterclockwise and M2 is going clockwise, then you're going to need to subtract them as you get to figuring out what your total moment is. And then I want to talk for just a minute about this picture. If you're in a situation where you actually know the angle between the line of application of F, the line of action of F, and the R, which happens sometimes in various products, we can consider that we can break F up into components perpendicular to and along the line of action of R. So if you break that into components, you'll have F sine theta and F cosine theta along and perpendicular to this line. That would just be this little triangle right in here. Well, think about this component for a minute. This component lies along R. 
So by the principle of transmissibility, you could slide this component all the way down until it was at A. This is what you get when you get the little kid that comes up to a clear glass door and pushes on the hinges. It doesn't work. This component does not create a moment at A. It's only this one that creates a moment at A. And it's perpendicular distance. I mean, by definition of this component, that's perpendicular distance is R. So you can say M is F sine theta, that's this component, times R. That's my scalar method, which gives me actually the definition of a cross product. It is all the same stuff. Next time we'll talk about couples and then reaction moments. Thanks.